Here I want to press two concerns. Okay? The first worry I have about theological voluntarism, there are lots of worries out there, but there, there are two that I think are particularly pressing. The first is on the theological voluntarist view, sometimes called divine command theory, right? um, is that on this view, natural facts are normatively impotent. They've got no power to morally require you to do one thing rather than another. Okay? Roughly put, a moral law expresses a, expresses a relationship of moral necessitation between some set of natural facts and the performance of some action. That this action is what one promised to perform morally necessitates one's promising it. Okay? Or more colloquially, because one promises to perform, one must perform. But notice that on the theological voluntarist view, these natural facts don't do the necessitating. Okay? At least they don't do it in any straightforward way. What does the necessitating is God's will and God's will alone. This follows from the voluntarist view that God's will is the immediate and complete act of explanation of the actions being required. Perhaps that does not sting when we're thinking about promising. Okay, yeah, promises, right? Um, but if we turn our attention to, a, say, a small child, okay, and the good of the child's life, and the way that which this being an innocent child's life seems to necessitate my refraining from harming the child, the sting intensifies. The voluntarist view closes off the good of the child's life from being in any way the wrong-making feature of the harming, relegating it to simply the occasion of wrongdoing. The second is a dilemma, the second worry I have, is a dilemma regarding the necessity or contingency of the moral law. So, a standard criticism of divine command theory, theological voluntarism, is that because the moral law comes from God's will, okay, it's God's willing that makes something morally right or morally wrong, and God's will is free, the moral law must be contingent, okay, that it, it, could, it could have been different than it in fact is. But it seems we don't want to say the moral law is as contingent, right, as the voluntarist view seems to make it. That this child is innocent necessarily makes it the case that I mustn't harm the child. Now, a standard response to this challenge okay, is that God necessarily fixes the moral law. Okay? At least those aspects of it, the necessity of which we're confident in, right, in the way that God does. But I find this solution peculiar and, and, and paradoxical. Okay? It looks for all the world, like these human interests, the, the good of the child's life, for example, right, have a normative power with respect to God that they don't have with respect to me. Okay? On, the, on, the, on, the, on the voluntarist view, right, the fact that, this, this, you know, that small children's life are valuable makes God, right, necessitates God's commanding us not to harm the child, right? even though we wouldn't have any uh, moral requirement not to harm the child until God commands us. Okay? That seems to me a strange view. Um, it seems to me that, something that anyone who takes this sort of necessity um, you know, branch of the dilemma uh, is stuck with, right? On the voluntarist view, um, on the voluntarist view, um, created nature can morally necessitate God's action when it doesn't morally necessitate our human action. And that seems to me really unfitting. I don't know, it, just, you know, it, it doesn't seem like it's the, it's the right sort of view one ought to have about the way, about, about, about human, human action um, and divine action. Okay, so my first point in the lecture, right, so where are we? My first point was this methodological point, okay? Let's get God in the story, okay? Let's get God in the story because, right, God, the, kind of, the kind of being that God is, God's got to be and, and, and got to have an explanatory role when we're giving an account of the moral law. And the second was this sort of bad news, right? It seems like there are two prominent views within theistic ethics right now. Neither of them are particularly good at, at, bring, at sort of capturing both the explanand-centered issues, that God's got to be at the center of things, and the explanandum-centered issues that, the, that created nature also has to have um, an important role in fixing the nature of the moral law. Okay? So, um, so yeah. if you think the method stuff was right, okay, um, then we've got a problem in theistic ethics, which is that the, that the main views out there don't provide an adequate account of the way that God is related um, to the holding of moral law. Okay. So here's the good news, right? I gave you the bad news. I'll give you the good news. The good news is that this problem has been thought through before, okay? The good news, not by moral philosophers, okay, um, but by the metaphysics people, all right? So, so this is, you know, when moral philosophers find themselves in a bad way, right, we start looking around to see if people outside of moral philosophy have come up with some, have found, have found a way, and you, all, you metaphysicians do it too, okay? You look to moral philosophy, supervenience, that's ours, okay? Um, uh, they, they find a way of, of seeing whether or not they're structurally similar problems, right, that have been dealt with, right, or I shouldn't, not 
dealt with, but that have been addressed in ways where we could fruitfully um, appropriate um, the work, good work that they've done. Okay? So here's the problem that I think that, that, that's sufficiently similar, sufficiently structurally similar, that we can look to it for guidance in trying to come up with a way of, of getting out of this, this bad news situation. Okay? The similar problem is that of God's relationship, the relationship between God and laws of nature. Okay? Those laws that express regularities uh, and even governing relationships in the natural order, fire burning cotton, right? water dissolving salt, and so forth. So let me describe a couple of theories, briefly, a couple of theories of God's relationship to the laws of nature, and let's see if they don't have a kind of a familiar ring. All right? Here's one view, a view that sometimes we call mere conservationism. On the mere conservationist view, God's explaining events in the natural order is typically um, neither immediate nor total for their natural agents that have their own proper power to bring about natural effects. God's role is merely that of bringing into existence and conserving in existence those natural agents. Okay? Given the kind to which those natural agents belong, right, it follows they will bring about determinate effects okay, under determinate conditions. In this sense only is God the first cause of every event in the natural order. God is the immediate cause of every effect. Right? It's just this complete dependence on God, on, on God for these things existing that explains how they act as they do, right? So if you want to know, sort of, well, what's the explanation of, of God's, how does, what role does God play um, if, you know, if water dissolves some salt? Well, God's role is simply conserving in existence this water and this salt, okay, um, given the kinds of things that they are, okay? Now, it doesn't sound to me at all like God actually explains the laws of nature on this view, right? If God's role with respect to the laws of nature is simply that of bringing into existence and conserving into, in existence beings with the relevant natures, then what we have explained is not the laws of nature, but why these nature laws are operative or effective. And that's a very different explanandum. Here's a rival view. Here's a second view right, of God's relationship with the natural order. It's called occasionalism. Right? According to this view, I love this view, every event in the natural order, okay, every event in the natural order has God as its immediate and total active cause. Okay? Immediate, because there are no natural agents as intermediaries. Total active, because there are no natural agents that have any active causal contribution to the event's occurrence. Okay? While some entities in the natural order might appear to exercise causal agency, the fire appears to cause the cotton to burn. This is mere appearance. Okay? There is no true causal efficacy in nature. Apparent causal efficacy is but occasional causation, labeled as such because the presence of such causes is merely the occasion for God's actively causing a state of affairs to obtain. That is, um, so, the presence of the fire near the cotton is just an occasion for God's willing the cotton to burn. Regularities in nature that are commonly attributed to intercreature causation, you know, what's between the fire and the cotton, or the water and the salt, are really nothing but manifestations of God's abiding intention to act in certain fixed ways. Now, I hope that these views sound kind of familiar. Mere conservationist accounts of God's relationship to the natural order are making the relevant substitutions, the standard natural law account of God's role with respect to the moral order. And occasionalist accounts of God's relationship to the moral order are making the relevant substitutions, theological voluntarist accounts of God's relationship to the moral order. Okay? Their strengths and weaknesses are unsurprisingly similar as well. Mere conservationism shares with natural law theory the strength of according a central role to creaturely natures and the weakness of shutting God out of any significant role in explaining the laws in which those creatures are implicated. Occasionalism shares with theological voluntarism the strength of being unquestionably theocentric and the weakness of denying any power, causal or moral, to creaturely natures. But here is one way in which the discussion is further advanced, okay, the discussion about the laws of nature. For we have in the discussion of the relationship between God and the laws of nature a well-worked-out third view. Okay. So here, so I, said, I was talking about the situation in theistic ethics where it seems like there are two theories, neither of which are satisfactory. If you look at the account of the theories of the laws of nature, we can see that there, there's actually a third view, right? Not just these two that seem to correspond um, with the ones that are showing up in moral philosophy, but a third view that, that claims to be able to capture um, what we need to capture, both uh, in terms of the theocentric elements and in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the natural elements. Right? Um, so here's, here's the view, right? So... Um, Okay, so the occasionalist says that God's role in necessitating events in the natural order is immediate and complete. The mere conservationist says it's incomplete because it's simply mediated, right? The transactions between creatures are just between, just between those creatures. But here's the third view, right? Suppose you can say that um, 
You know, in order to get God involved in everything, you don't have to have God be the complete cause of every event, right, in the natural order. Just God has to be immediate, right? God's role has to be immediate, okay, just not mediated by something else. So, so that in every transaction, right, divine power is immediately manifested, right? Um, but you don't have to say that God is solely responsible for every effect, right? You can say that the, the, the action that occurs in the natural order um, is, a, is a result of kind of cooperation, cooperation between God and creatures, okay? So there's hope to meet the objection to mere conservationism that it makes God explanatorily superfluous and the objection to occasionalism that it makes creaturely natures explanatorily superfluous. This third view is called concurrentism. It is disputed among concurrentists about you know, and how in formulating the position the, the best way to characterize the respective role um, of God and creatures. And I, and I don't confess to understanding well the various benefits and burdens of taking on one another these formulations. After all, as I've allowed, I'm a poor moral philosopher, uh, gleaning the remainders from the exalted fields of the metaphysicians. Right? Put broadly, right, just put it in very, very broad terms, with regard to each natural effect, God's contribution is general or universal while the creature's contribution is specific or particular. To each effect, God contributes something general, like undifferentiated power, while the creaturely agent contributes a specific way that this power will affect other objects. Again, as Aquinas puts it, creaturely causes are, quote, like particularizers and determinants of the primary agents that is God's action. This is all very abstract. All right, so let me, let's consider the following analogy, what, kind of what the concurrence view has in mind. Think of an overhead projector, right? Um, not power, overhead, got to be overhead, right? On whose surface is placed a clear plastic sheet on which a variety of colored shapes have been drawn. Okay, so imagine the, an overhead transparency and it's got a, a, a solid red circle and a solid um, you know, green square and so forth, right? Flip on the overhead, right? And then, bam, on the wall appears, right? Red triangle, blue square, green octagon and so forth. We might refer to both the overhead and the ink shapes and even the most immediate explanation of the presence of the images on the wall. The overhead projector's contribution is to produce the light that beam the images. And the ink shapes determined, along with the nature of the wall, the particular images that appeared. This is a close analogy of the concurrentist view on how God and creatures cooperate in the natural order. Just as the overhead is kind of a generic cause, right, by producing an undifferentiated beam of light, God is the general cause of all events in the natural order. Just as the particular ink shapes right, determine the particular effects that will show up on the wall, right, the natures of individual creatures determine what particular effects will be produced by them. So how then does concurrentism give an account of the laws of nature and God's role with respect to them? Well, look, the specific, creatures, specific effects that creatures can cause is determined by the nature of those creatures. Okay? It is false to say that the creatures make no real contribution, to the, no real difference to the effects that are brought about. Just as it would be false to say that the color and shape of the ink figures on the overhead sheet make no real difference to what's projected on the screen. But if we want to say that fire burns cotton is a law of nature, okay, we should be careful about how we formulate the view and make some distinction with, distinctions with respect to it. It is a law of nature in that given God's ordinary concurrence, God's ordinary contribution to the natural order, fire burns the cotton. We can call these ordinary worlds. And ordinary worlds being placed in fire and being cotton necessitates being burned. But, be, but because God's contribution to this sort of effect is free, right, God might choose to withhold God's contributions in extraordinary worlds. And in those worlds, flame might very well fa fail to burn the cotton, okay? uh, much less burn Shadrach, Meshach, or Abednego. Okay? Now, I've, de I've described this debate about God's relationship uh, to the natural order in a way that obviously brings up my attraction to the concurrentist view. Take, take it for no more than it's worth, okay? My attraction to it is, is much more for what it promises. That is, an account of the natural order in which no real, no real transaction is just between those two creatures, okay? Um, for God is always present and active in every transaction. But yet the creatures are not idle, right? For they genuinely make a difference to how those transactions go. It is not an attraction based on reliable confidence that the details um, have been or will be delivered. That debate is still going on. But of course, my primary concern is not with the natural order, but the moral order. And the question there is, can we describe an analog of the concurrentist view for moral philosophy, right, for ethics, on which there's neither the distancing of God present within standard natural law theory, nor the strip stripping of creaturely difference making present in theological voluntarism? 
is there then a normative analog to concurrentism? On the concurrentist view, and with respect to nature, right, God concurs to creatures with what you might call their efficient causality, okay, where God contributes to creaturely nature in a general way, and, pardon me, contributes to the effects in a general way and creatures in a specific way. If you were to offer a normative or moral concurrentism, right, thinking about moral law, you wouldn't emphasize God as first and general efficient cause, that is, you know, pulling the levers that get things going in the world, um, but as first and general final cause, right, as the good, what's ultimately and finally worth pursuing and having. It's not at all unnatural to think of particular goods as distinct, partial, diverse exemplifications of goodness, different guises under which the good can appear. But if nothing is good but God alone, if God is alone good without qualification, then we can see all the distinct and incommensurable goods that demand a response as participations in the divine goodness. Indeed, they demand a response. They morally necessitate our action just because they're participations in the divine goodness. <laughs>